How's it going folks? Welcome back to the channel. Thanks for joining me today. So I hope everyone enjoyed the first game of the Sydney Super Cup. Obviously not the result that we wanted, but it was good to see Celtic in a morning kickoff. I'm not going to be talking about that game in this video. What I wanted to do was hop on and talk about the Juranovic situation because last night in the huddle breakdown we discussed the breaking news that Juranovic, his talks between him and the club over a new contract have broken down according to the press and he could be leaving the club after the World Cup and Celtic are opening up their negotiations for his future at the club and whether or not he's going to be there after Christmas or not. So what I actually wanted to do in this video was to bring you a bit of the discussion from last night and a bit of the discussion from about a month ago where we spoke about Juranovic and Ralston and the difference between the two, what Ralston brings to the club as opposed to Juranovic, whether Ralston is ready to step up into the first team position and whether or not Celtic are going to be drastically weakened by losing Juranovic. So there's a bit from last night's huddle breakdown, so apologies if you watched last night's video, then you can probably skip forward about 22 minutes into this video and get to the discussion between Ralston and Juranovic. But if you haven't seen it, so this is last night's discussion about Juranovic, the breaking news that was and whether or not we should sell him or where, what kind of position we would be in. And in the second half of this video is from four weeks ago from the huddle breakdown where we actually went into the numbers between Ralston and Juranovic. So I thought good context for what's going on at the minute for people who want to know whether or not Celtic should actually sell Juranovic, what Tony Ralston's ability is, and whether or not we will be losing a lot of quality down the right side by selling Juranovic after Christmas. So enjoy. We're going to kick off with some breaking news from the day, and that is that Joseph Juranovic has reportedly uh, not rejected a Celtic contract, but talks have broke down between him and the club, and the World Cup is going to be a springboard for potentially or starting right right back to leave the club. So this was reported widely across the different news organisation. Fabrizio Romano had it, and this could be the moment where one of Ange's first signings leaves the club after the World Cup. He does have the World Cup with Croatia to sort of springboard, and maybe if he has a good one, maybe up that price tag a little bit as well for Celtic. So that's what we're going to kick off with. Alan, if you look at this transfer as a whole, it probably makes sense. It probably is what Celtic intended to do with Juranovic in the first place. Not too often we buy a, an international player of his stature and in terms of the, the international team that he starts in his position for. Celtic signed Juranovic for $2.5 million at the time on a five-year contract. He was 26 at the time. He's 27 now and has four years left in his contract. So what are we thinking in terms of the transfer fee that we would be potentially... <laughs> hoping to accept for this. <laughs> yeah, so I'll tell you why I was laughing later. Um, yeah, I, I, first of all, I was a bit sceptical to read about you know negotiating a new contract when he's got four years left on his contract. That seemed rather odd, but the source for this seems to be, you know, we've got Stephen McGowan in the, in the mail running with it. Stephen seems to be very well connected in Celtic. So it's, and as you say, if Fabrizio Man, Romano's got his... Twitter account all over it. That seems to be the, the gold standard these days for for transfer gossip. So, um, you know, if I was looking through the Celtic squad, it, it would be the one that made the most sense to me. I think, as you alluded to, and I think that's absolutely absolutely right because for many reasons, um, one is is age. I mean, really, um, and the fact that you know, I suspect he will be a starter for Croatia. So, in terms of that shot window, is is good timing. Um, and you know the manager has said quite openly that we need to be much more aggressive about our player trading model. And by more aggressive, it means probably a, a, not just more, you know, not just getting better players, but also actually turning over faster, having a, a bigger turnover. You know, I think the um, the Swiss Ramble analysis of Celtic's accounts, which was done in the week, uh, which is a, you know a stunningly thorough piece of work for somebody who. You know, he's got no skin in the game and does hundreds of football clubs. Actually, it's a tremendous. I don't know if it's one person or whether it's a an army of them, but it's, it's a tremendous piece of work. Anyway, um, you know, th there was a very very telling um, piece of that analysis which showed that you know S Celtic are in Scottish terms re remarkably successful in um, selling players um, going back ten years, but in European terms, which is 
should be the benchmark, as James has, has, told, has, has, has opined many a time correctly. Uh, we're, we're, we're nowhere uh, in terms of just the volume, you know, t- t- selling players for 7 million and 5 million and 3 million and what have you, and the occasional 10 million is great in Scotland in terms of, you know, that that, that sort of um, keep, you're keeping keeping control in that market. But, you know, you, we're not near we're not near the regularly selling a 25 million or a 30 million every year. And you only do that by increasing the rate of churn, getting more players in, um, selling for higher, getting more players that cost you more to sell for higher. It's a virtuous cycle that you you have to get into. So if that's, that's I think, it's strategically where we're trying to get to, Juranovic mm. appears to me to be one of the the, the 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 better cases. Not only that, because you know as well, we've got an a, a more than able deputy in the short term in in Tony Ralston. So um, it does make it does make a lot of sense. I think is what is the bottom line. But as I say, it's just a bit odd that it's it, it's you know it, or, or, is 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 he ag- agitating for a move or is it a bit of push and pull on both sides? I don't know. I'm still I'm still a little bit skeptical about that. I would say Celtic are probably more than happy to use the World Cup to springboard them. Oh, unfortunately for them, Croatia don't really have that strong of a team going into this World <clears> Cup <throat> as opposed to the last one. So whether or not he'll perform to his best is a uh, another question altogether. But Thanks. James, there's a lot. Go- there's a lot goes into transfer fees in the first place, and there's a lot goes into sort of making these transfers happen. I think firstly you have to look at the precedent in Scotland. What is the record? And that is Kieran Tierney, 27 million, but he was 22 years old. Calvin Bassey, 23 million to Ajax this year, also 22. Juranovic is 27. Now, the four-year four year deal, that definitely plays into Celtic's hands in terms of the uh, negotiation um, tactics that they can use in it. But there are only a select few clubs in the world, I would argue, that are going to take a gamble on a 20, 27-year-old right back. And that would be a bigger club rather than a smaller to mid-table club in the likes of the Premier League. That he was linked with Atletico Madrid during the summer. That sounds to me like an Atletico Madrid type signing, a 27 year old rather than going for the. Like, a, let, let's use Southampton as the best example of that. They don't buy 27 year olds, they buy younger players, as do most teams that are trying to use good, smart transfers uh, in order to get value in the market. So, this to me sounds like it's a bigger club that are going to come in for, for Juranovic here. Yeah, and I, I think his uh, profile um, suits something like a playing style of, of Atletico Madrid, meaning that um, you know one of his big um, attributes is carrying the ball and and countering. Uh, so that that's a you know kind of textbook um, Atletico when they're again when they're up against um, you know, the top teams in their league and, and in European competition. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, I would think it would be, you know, kind of a mid table, big five, um, league type of, of team that would be looking at them. Um, and you know, that's basically, I mean, they've obviously had a really good run at times in the last, uh, you know, what, six, seven years, but that's kind of where they've settled in, in Spain, even, um, you know, they've kind of fallen out of that top four or five. Um, and, you know, they haven't modernized. They're one of the clubs that, you know, is still kind of sticking to the old ways uh, to a large degree. So I'm very, very manners, uh, manager centric, um, old school philosophy. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I got a lot of uh, warm um, embrace back in August by saying <laughs> we should be selling him and Jack Amakis in August if we could get that kind of money for him. I mean, again, uh, uh, I, I was heartened to hear Ange's comments um, because if you can get, let's say, 20, 25 million in total for those two players, I mean, that that's the aggressive kind of model that, you know, Alan's referencing and that Ange mentioned. Because, um, again, you just think about mm. the multiplier effect. You get, you know, let's say 20, 25 million, you turn that into three, three Jotas or... You know, and and it, that's what's been. Th- there's only so many Hatates and O'Reillys that we're going to be able to pluck out of the market, right? At some point, we're going to have to start spending money. You know, we've had so many needs, so much of an overhaul required. The depth was so bad last season um, that you know, for us to kind of get up that ramp where we're spending five, six, 
seven million as a matter of course, meaning that we take the Hitate one to two, three million and ramp that up to five, six, seven. And then the stretch ones like the Jotas then are the 10, 11, 12 million. And that's, I think that's where we're, we should be going in the next year or two, but that requires starting the process of selling some of these names, including Jota, including, you know, and anyone who's not nailed down, which probably is McGregor, <laughs> um, pretty much everyone else for the most parts probably got a for sale sign and they should, um, in this whole process. And not saying, not saying you sell everybody. I'm just saying that you, you know, you need to monetize your most attractive assets that, that makes sense. Uh, and I think for the point that you guys mentioned, I mean, his profile is, I mean, this is when you sell them. Um, so hit the cash register. I mean, let's be brutally honest about this, right? What we saw in the Champions League is that I would I would say, and I'm going to get abuse for this, but the vast majority of players in the team aren't good enough for that level, and they're clearly very you know too, you know too good for the SPFL. So you could you could almost sell, you know, you've got to start finding a way to get to that better quality of player if you want to truly compete at Champions League level. We were utterly outclassed by Real Madrid, and we gave it a great shot. We were brave. We had a right go, but we were utterly outclassed. I mean, there was an enormous gulf between the two teams. And if we want to start to bridge that gap, we're going to have to start churning the squad and getting, as James said, not the not the three million, two and a half million little gems. It's the spending 11 million on enormous potential and turning it into 30, 40 million. Frankly, that's the way, the only way we're going to do it. And then you got to start yeah. and that's somewhere. Yeah, and that, that, that's part of the process as well. This first sort of wave of, and signings, they were they weren't going to sell for the thirty five to fifty million range. You know, you're not bringing in a two million player. Very very rarely you're bringing in a two million player and you're selling him for you know a, a couple of multipliers of that. We'll probably probably end up selling Juranovic for the range of twelve to fifteen million in the same vein as Chris Ryer in in that in that aspect, but. If you think about the way the transfers work and the way that money works, and this is something that a lot of people don't realize, is that, okay, let's say Atletico Madrid come in for Juranovic and pay us 12 to 15 million. That's not just immediately in your bank account. That'll be worked out in terms of the amount of years it's in his contract and it'll come in over the course of a number of years. So if Celtic sell Juranovic, for example, and they get in someone on a loan to buy option and that loan to buy option is five to six million like Jota was, then Celtic will have that in their accounts the following year in order to uh, make make use of that five to six million they're they're bringing in, and then a couple of years down the line they sell that player, sort of like what they're doing with Jota. So this is a long process. It's not going to be okay. We buy Juranovic, we sell Juranovic, we have Juranovic replacement. This might be a two to three year thing where we're we're bringing in and selling these players off. But for me, this is good, James, because this shows that not only again. Uh, uh, <laughs> The one thing you can say about Ange is he's been a man of his word, and not only about a week or two ago he was talking about ramping up this aggressive transfer policy, and it seems like that's the way this is going to go. I would not be surprised if it was Celtic that leaked this story to the press, as opposed to Juranovic leaking it himself. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a strong feeling on that, but I, I, I think that the um, the other part of this is uh, we have a uh, locked and loaded, capable first team player to, to, to step in, meaning that, you know, e even if it, let, let's just say that it was Greg Taylor, that this was the rumor about, and you know, obviously it's not a completely different situation, but just hypothetically, I would have a little bit more anxiety that Burnaby would then be the, you know, the number one, and there's no depth behind him to speak of that I know of, unless there's somebody, you know, with, with the B team that I'm not aware of. Um, so I, I have a lot more comfort that Ralston's the person that's going to step in here um because at the domestic level he's proven that he's more than capable if you know we've had this discussion in, in ways he's actually been a superior option um to Juranovic domestically against a lot of opposition and um so it's a question of depth then uh you know who's who's then and to your point whether that's a loan whether that's a somebody that you identify as a loan to buy or maybe you bring in someone who's younger you know, more of a premium prospect for a larger amount that then has that, you know, second half of the season to get into the system and, you know, acclimated to 
uh, the league and the culture and everything. So that, you know, that's how you start this conveyor belt. Um, and it, you know, it, that's the great part is we do have someone that I think is a very low risk, um, person to absorb that production in those minutes. Um, and I mean, that's ideal. Again, that's the idea. That's the idea here is to be able to do this so that when you have someone to sell, the market conditions are right. The relationship is right for all parties involved, or most importantly for the club that you're not taking a huge step down in quality in order to take advantage of the financial part of it. Um, so here we're going to get the upside of the, of the money. The production is going to remain comparable for the rest of the season. Again, barring some kind of injury situation. Um, maybe lock and load the next guy stepped up for the depth or maybe you know maybe it's the person for next champions league season that's a little younger that that just needs some time to get ready for that uh level of competition win 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 other, yeah. other than you know again this is the emotional part of it if, if Duranovich is your favorite player this sucks <laughs> right mm -hmm. so you know there's the supporter side of this which is when you you know you lose um uh fa fan favorites then you know that's never fun but from a from a ruthless uh, uh, anal uh, analytics and and uh, kind of a business sense uh, perspective, it's to me it's uh, a slam dunk. Mm -hmm. I should say at this point that it's not confirmed that he's leaving the club. It's just that there are stories um, going around that he has rejected or the talks have broken down between him and the club. So it looks like he's on the way out the door. I actually almost burst out laughing when you said that uh, we don't have a low risk player. For left back because sure Liam Scales is only on loan. He's, he's does a, he have a callback back option next year? Does he have a callback? <laughs> and I'm, I'm, pretty pretty sure, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's just it's and, just a loan. Uh, it's not a loan to buy. So yeah, rumors that Ange just deleted his number from his phone are, are scurrilous. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Short short memories on this podcast that Liam Scales is only away on loan. That's that's the problem. Um, no, look. So that's the that's the Juranovic news of the day. We'll wait and see how that develops over the next couple of weeks. Let's hope he does have a good. World Cup campaign with Croatia because it would be nice to see a Celtic player doing well on the, the biggest scale in, in, in football. I want to start with right back because that's where I've been talking about for the last number of weeks and questioning whether Juranovic should be rested and, and Anthony Rawson get an opportunity. He certainly got his opportunity in this game and I think he took it quite well and look, we, we have to probably once again acknowledge that he wasn't up against much when it came to his defensive actions, but going forward is where I have my biggest issue with Juranovic. I think he can often be wasteful in the final third with his crossing. Rawson, I think, put in a couple of good crosses in this game, and he also played the amazing through ball to Leila Bada for Giacomacus' uh, second goal. So I think he showed a lot going forward and showed that he is Celtic's second choice right back for a reason and, and is, is there to challenge Juranovic. Willing to be corrected on all of this, but Alan, what did you make of uh, Ralston? And what, uh, so are the, again, what are his what's his attacking output in comparison to Juranovic? Yeah, so I dug out a few things just just for you, right? So obviously with Ralston, I mean Juranovic has played, um, I think equivalent of around ten games this season, whereas I think Ralston's up around four, maybe five games uh, worth of minutes. So a bit of a warning uh, there. Yeah, four point yeah four point one, let's call it. But so I think this is a classic. I think there's two things at play here in terms of what's driving perception. If you if you weren't following the numbers closely, uh, one is the classic um, what you actually produce versus how you're performing <laughs> conundrum, which I think we're seeing it positively fall um, uh, uh, Ralston's way. And the second is to do with just sheer volume of involvement, so just number of actions on the ball. So let me kind of explain that a little bit more. So with Ralston then, I, I couldn't believe this. I know he's only played four games, but I don't believe he's had a single shot at goal yet in, the, in, 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 any, in any game. Now, I'm willing to be corrected on that, and I might have made a mistake somewhere, but I'd, I've got him as zero shots, right? Zero XG, right? Whereas Juranovic's XG is only 0 0.04. So they're not, not, neither of them are really carrying much of a goal threat. But in chances created, which is probably more important, you might surprise you to know that you, uh, Ralston's 1.47 chances created and uh, Juranovic is 1.65. Uh, XG, X, X, sorry, expected assists, Ralston's 0.18, uh, Juranovic is 0.28. So again, uh, ball carries, again, might surprise you, Ralston's 
2.8, sorry, Juranovic is 3.4. Um, however, scoring contribution, and this is where I came back to actual goals and assists, Ralston's 0.5 per game, and Juranovic is only 0.18. So this is a classic case where Ralston's, uh, Juranovic sorry, is actually producing more chances, creating more chances, more aggressive ball carrying, but it's Ralston, because he's had a, maybe one or two assists, um, he's actually uh, you know, got, got points on the board, and that's what people tend to remember. If you look at expected scoring contribution, it's 0.18 for um, Rolston and 0.32 for Juranovic. So to your point about going forward and delivery, actually Juranovic is performing a lot better. Or not a lot better, but slightly better than Rolston. Now, where Rolston has been more effective thus far is in what I call ball progression. So this is, think of it, I, I tend to think of, you know, when I think about performance, um, almost like three different um, men of the match. Who's been the best defender, defensive action? Who's been the best ball progressor, getting the ball forward? And who's been the best, who's had the most attacking threat? And I think that's a, a fair way of giving everyone in the team a crack at one of those. So if you look at the, the middle of that, which is ball progression, then pack passes, so that's forward passes that take players out of the game, in terms of pack passing score, Ralston is averaging 57 a game and Juranovic 44. In terms of recovery, so this is recovering the ball and, um, you know, um, uh, is therefore taking players out of the game through kind of interceptions, then um, it's five to Ralston and 16 to uh, Juranovic. And in terms of four, in terms of turnovers, Juranovic uh, turns the ball over more often uh, you know, 14 to, to 10. But if you look at their total possessions in a game, Ralston averages 97 possessions, uh, Juranovic only 70. Uh, Ralston averages 61 passes completed a game and Juranovic 46. So listen, a lot of data thrown at you there, but if I would summarise it, I would say um, Ralston's had more actual goals and assists, but Juranovic's underlying data is better. Um, Ralston uh, progresses the ball better and is just physically on the ball more, so he, he looks like he's doing more because he's he's, he's involved more than Juranovic is. So that's that's the uh, kind of uh, summary, if you like. Um, uh, make of that what you will, but I think that's the, hopefully a balanced view. I'll give you the conclusion. Ralston's better. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, no, look, it's obviously look. I, the the main thing that I wanted to to bring to this was that. A lot of people sort of scoffed at the idea that Ralston could come in and replace Juranovic at right back, but Ralston is there for a reason. And if you can't question whether or not your backup right back can come in and do a job equally or as good as the current starting right back, then there's no point in him being at the club because you're weakening that position. And obviously there are you can't have like for like in every position, but I think Ralston does bring something a little bit different to Juranovic and maybe it is that I'm noticing he's, he's getting on the ball a little bit more and 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 maybe he's just he catches your eye more because he is on the ball but I I thought he was he was quite good uh, at the weekend and probably merits a start again tomorrow night but we'll wait and see there is obviously the Champions League coming up uh, next week and there's a game in between that so it will be interesting to see what happens with this right back situation because I mean, sometimes the best thing to do for a player is to take him out of the line, like take him off the pitch, and maybe Juranovic will come back, and he'll be even better next time when he's when he's starting for Celtic. So we'll we'll wait and see on that.